Good morning, good morning. It's good to see everyone here. Um, this is going to be the second lesson in our series, Our Life Together. And this one is called An Intimate Household. Because what's more important than having a household that is close-knit and close together, right? Because those are the people you're going to spend most of your time with. Um, you know, if you're anything like me, if you have a family, you have kids, and a uh, real soon to be wife in six days. Um, it is so important to have that closeness with one another, that cohesiveness. So in our previous lesson, we brought up the question as to whether churches today are engaged in the type of fellowship practiced by churches in the New Testament. Ask questions as to whether churches today are communities of believers expressing a sense of concern for one another, or if they are simply groups of anonymous worshipers. What was considered is factors in our society which tempt us to be self-centered, which unfortunately the current generations, it's, it's a pretty self-centered um, generation of people, unfortunately. And we talked about how an attitude of self-centeredness is foreign to the very basics of Christ's teaching. He was not in any way self-centered, in fact, more often, um, not more often, always, was selfless and served others. So in this lesson, I wish to examine more carefully the teaching of Christ concerning the nature of the church he said he would build, and how his teaching ought to shape the type of fellowship he wanted the members of his church to experience. So as we begin, let's consider some contrasting views of the church. So if we go into the different views of the church, how modern man tends to view the church is the first thing I'm going to deal with. Well, as many, they'll see it as an institution or an organization, right? Um, many people say it, it religion. It's a sense of organization that you know, believe they have their own belief system and they have, you know, their own government and the way they govern things. Terms which are, these are analogies of some business or a corporation. Thus, we find terms frequently used like associate minister or superintendent of education or director of music. While the church was divinely instituted by God and does have some organization, because you have to, it seems that many have molded the local church into a business-like structure. And the minute we start bringing business and worldly ideas into a congregation, the more likely you are you're going to have some power struggles. You're going to have people who are going to see it one way. If they have previous experience in running a business and they see... You know, the church starting to go that way, a lot of people are going to try to take advantage of that. They're going to take, try to take control of that. And you'll see many churches who have gone too far that way. And unfortunately, when you go too far that way, you start to see the church more as a business. And then you start to ask for funding and you start to ask people why, you know, haven't they been giving? And that turns a lot of people off. And we do not ever want to get that far into the wrong, I would say. Because when you start to do stuff like that, you're becoming more like the world, not what Christ wanted the church to be set up as. And that's what we're going to talk about, how Jesus viewed the church differently. He viewed it as a family, not as a business, not as an organization, who would be just doing the will of his Father. We are to be doing the will of God. In Matthew 12, verse 46 through 50, Matthew 12, verse 46 through 50, we're talking about Jesus' mother and brothers here. He says, While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who said, who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. 
anyone who's been a Christian for a while knows that you have your, you know, your immediate mother, brother, sister, whatever it may be, father, right? If you were of Christ, we are all family. It can be your wife and your sister in Christ. It can be your husband and brother in Christ. You cannot be even of the same family, but as long as you're of the same spiritual family, you're brothers and sisters. And that's how it needs to be looked at. This is all talked about in Matthew 7, verse 21. Where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So not everyone that's going to call on Jesus is going to make it in heaven. But if you do the will of Christ, we are all family and we are all one. And we will all be going to the same place. Indeed, both Jesus and his apostles often use the family motive in speaking of the church. Jesus himself would speak of God as his father in John 2.16. John 2.16, which says, And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away, do not make my father's house a house of trade. <clears throat> and this is when he was in the temple, the money changers, and he flipped the tables. This is also why the Jews questioned him. How do you have this authority? We talked about this in class earlier. Because he says, it's my father's house. I'm like, your father? This is a temple for God. So he refers to God as his father. His followers, he spoke of as family relatives. And teach his disciples to address God as our father. Like we see in Matthew 6.9. Which we'll turn over there, Matthew 6, verse 9. Which says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Everyone knows that. He refers to God as his Father multiple times. The apostles refer to the church as a brotherhood. In 1 Peter, two seventeen. First Peter two verse seventeen says, "Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor." The church was a brotherhood. The church was their group of people that they considered family. And again, as the house or family of God. And the one we'll look at there is 1 Timothy 3.15. 1 Timothy 3.15. Which says, if I delay, you may know how one ought to be behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar in the buttress of the truth. It's the house of God because we're family. Right? We're all in the same house right now. We're in the church. It's the church body. The church is the body. Wherever you're at, and you're joined together, is the house of God. And so the church Jesus established was to be an intimate household, allowing a close list not usually found in organizations or institutions. It's all about business in places like that. I mean, we're in the right business. It's called saving souls, right? Even when Jesus talked to Peter, he said, you're... You're still a fisherman. You're just a fisher of men. You're not fishing for fish. 
In fact, every aspect of the life of God's people is to manifest the closeness of family intimacy. So let's talk about how family intimacy is to permeate church life. In our relationship with each other should be one of the most important things we look at. We are to be like little children. We're going to spend some time in Matthew. We'll start in chapter 18. And we will be bouncing back between a few chapters here in Matthew. If you turn over to Matthew 18, we'll read verse 1 through 4. Matthew 18, verse 1 through 4. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them, and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is one of the times that you hear Jesus say directly that children will automatically go to heaven. Because they are guiltless. They are innocent. That's why he says, unless you become one of these, one of these children, you won't enter into the kingdom. Because most children don't know right from wrong. They're still learning. They're innocent. Not striving for dominance over each other, but with humility, showing submissiveness, and with dependence upon one another. Those things can be so important to build our relationship with each other. We don't need to strive for dominance over each other. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We're all equals. Christ is still king. It doesn't matter what you say or do. It's still the Lord's will, not our own. So let's talk about our next topic. It says, in our concern for each other. <clears throat> we need to be concerned about each other. It's important. We need to be concerned with protecting the members of our family from harm, just like anyone would do. Someone walks into your house and they threaten you or your family. Are you going to protect them? Are you going to protect yourself? Absolutely. But are you going to protect your fellow brethren from spiritual harm? It's a lot harder to do. You know why? Because there's more temptations out there. The devil is consistently hurling darts at you. And you do have a shield Maybe not a physical one. Well, man, wouldn't that be cool? But you have a spiritual shield that you can put up to protect you and your family, your brethren. We'll read further in Matthew 18, verse 5 through 7, where Jesus says, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever ca causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him to have a great millstone fashioned around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptation to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. He's saying, if you cause one of these children to sin, it's better to wrap a big rock around your neck and to drown at the bottom of the ocean. That's pretty blunt, but needed to be said, because if you're coming in and you're taking one of the most innocent people who he says are already inheriting the kingdom of God, and you are trying to make them sin, and you are trying to bring them down, then you are the problem, and you need to be, you need to be gone. Or most are, you need to change, because... We all fall short to the glory of God. And if we find ourselves trying to push someone else to sin, then we need to figure out our, and figure out our own lives there. We need to repent. And we need to have that godly sorrow. And we need to change and be more Christ-like. So another thing we're talking about, our concern for each other, 
is for the one who strays. As we are with the one who continues in the fellowship. So let's continue in Matthew 18. Let's read 10 through 14. We're talking about the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them go, has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. I think if you've been a Christian for long enough, you've heard the 99 and the 1. He's not saying he doesn't care for the 99 righteous that are still standing there. That's great, they're still righteous. But that one who goes astray is going to need more help to get back. He is the one that fell away. They are the ones that you need to reach out to. They are the ones that if you are seeing falling, maybe they're not coming to church anymore. Maybe that you see their sinful actions out in the world and you don't say anything to them. Then you are letting them stay lost. We don't want anyone to stay lost. To be Christian is to be Christ-like. Jesus would go after the one. Are we going after the one that we see in our lives that has gone astray? Our next topic is going to be talking about our discipline of one another. We are to remember that we are brethren. We need to follow a procedure that utilizes the full advantage of our relationship as a family. To go further in Matthew 18, we're going to read 15 through 17. It says, if you're, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. If we follow that procedure and we deal with every situation like that, we go to them first and we do that in private. If they're still not understanding, you bring two or three witnesses. If they still don't listen to all of you there and you go to the church and they still do not listen, then you are to not have fellowship with that person because they have gone too far under. Do you still pray for them and do you still... Do everything you can to try to help them come back to Christ? Absolutely. But if they become bad company, it's easy for bad company to corrupt good morals. Don't want to fall into that pit. And we need to treat the one disciplined as a brother. In 2 Thessalonians 3, Verse 6 through 15, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6 through 15. This is warning against idleness. It says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness, and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with the toil and labor we worked night and day, that we may not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we... 
persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. If we see anyone being idle, and we see them doing the wrong thing, we need to seek after them. But to a point, again, like I said, you can warn them as a brother, but it doesn't mean you have to associate your whole lives around them. We do our best to make sure that we do not have one that goes astray. If the brother in error is not responsive, like what we talked about, we need to take advantage of the family relationship which we have enjoyed by depriving the erring brother of it. That is that discipline that that brother or sister who has done wrong now does not have that family relationship anymore. And most will feel the guilt that comes with that. Indeed, the failure of much discipline is due to the lack of proper fellowship to begin with. If we have good fellowship we should know how to have a relationship with each other. We should know how to have concern for each other. And we should know how we should deal with discipline towards one another. So let's talk about the next one in forgiving each other. That can be one of the most important. Realizing the value of this intimate family relationship. Forgiveness is to be automatic upon repentance. Back in Matthew 18. Verses 21 through 22. That's Matthew 18. Verses 21 through 22. It says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. If your brother sins against you, you are to forgive him. Not just a certain amount of times. Because forgiveness isn't on the person being forgiven. It is on the person that is forgiven. You hold that in your heart. And you're holding that against your brother or sister. We are not to keep a tally of our offenses, for such would hinder our relationship as a family. We are to keep in mind how our Father has forgiven us. That our forgiveness by God is contingent on our forgiveness of our brethren. So as we continue in Matthew 18, we're going to read 23 through 25. That says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. If we don't forgive each other, Christ will not forgive us. Something to think about. We'll go on to our last one. It says, we need to be in service to one another. Our older brother came to serve. 
in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28. says but Jesus called to them called them to him and said you know that the rulers of the gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them it shall not be so among you but whoever would be great among you you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave even as the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many even Christ served. And we are to serve one another. As we would in our physical family. As the saying goes, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. Because in our physical family, we would do everything to help our brothers and sisters and mother and father. All of these things are emphasizing an important spiritual truth. The church is to be such a fellowship of believers that it can be rightly considered as, one, a home away from home, two, a home which is our true home. So allow me to expand on that last thought. The church. What is it? It's our true home, right? The cost of discipleship can be great. For some, it may even mean forsaking their earthly family. In Matthew 10, verse 34 through 39, talks about this. Matthew 10, verses 34 through 39. So Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. No one is to be put above Christ. And that can be hard to do. Because you want to have peace, and you want to have love, and you want to have that intimate relationship with your family. But sometimes you have to put them away to follow Christ. And it's never easy, but Christ is with you through it all, if that is something that needs to happen. Christ intends for his church to make up for any cost. Whether it be the cost of putting Christ before family, or the cost of leaving family to serve Christ. For example, like going to missionary trips. Christ has promised a hundredfold in replacement. In Mark 10, 28 through 30. Mark 10, 28 through 30. It says, Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. He's saying if you stop and you drop everything and you follow me, there would be a hundredfold given back to you. Let's go further and say the church can be a home for all. Everyone can have the church as their family. Especially for those away from home. For example, the college students or international students. The church can be the home for them. 
especially for those who have never had a family at all, or an incomplete one, such as orphans or those with single parents. And especially for those from a dysfunctional family. For example, those who are neglected or those who have been abused. I say you probably see that one more than anything. Because dysfunction can be everywhere. But know that we are your family. And we are here for you. But for the church to be the home Christ intended, the family members must do their part. And for some, that might mean making some changes. So let's talk about building family intimacy in the church. We may need to spend more time with each other. That's part of fellowship. For some, it may mean being more faithful about attending services. For others, it may mean widening our circle of fellowship to include others. For all of us, it means being less self-centered, being more willing to become involved with the concerns of others. And we may need to become more involved in the work of the church family. For our task is not just to create some sort of social club. It's not what church is. It's a place of worship. It's a place for us to fellowship. It's a place for us to love one another, to serve one another, to sing songs and spiritual songs, and to praise God. It is to remember his death, burial, and resurrection, and his sacrifice in our life. But a family of believers who are active in doing the will of their Father in heaven, including saving souls, restoring the erring, and edifying the saved, are going to be the people who are most involved in any congregation. And if you are not doing one of those things and you want to change, then I suggest you do so. Indeed, reconciling all with the Father and his family, we should be doing that as Christians in a church body. So we need to provide the appropriate service, which in turn builds intimacy. So what are these? Preaching and teaching. Exhorting and restoring. Ministering to the needs of the family, both spiritual and physical. And if you are not doing those things, and you have found yourself idle and not growing, Maybe you should find a way to further serve your family. In conclusion, what are we doing to see that the church is fulfilling its design to be an intimate household? What are we doing? If we are doing nothing, or if we are depriving others from trying to become close to us, then we are depriving ourselves of one of the greatest blessings found in Christ. And we are also giving the impression that we may be false disciples of Christ. Turn over to John 13, verse 35. John 13, verse 35. Jesus says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Are we loving each other? Are we edifying each other? Are we trying to save souls? Are we preaching? Are we teaching? Are we edifying each other? Do we have love? Are we concerned? Are we disciplined? Brethren, let's all work harder at being the kind of family God would have us all to be. If becoming a child of God is, our, is your need today, consider what Paul wrote about how we become sons of God. And we will look at that as our last verse, and that is in Galatians 3, 
verse 26 through 27. Galatians 3, verse 26 through 27, which says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all brothers and sisters. We are all family. Are we treating each other like so? If not, I urge you, today and throughout this week, to reflect on the kind of person you are in, in this family, in this church body. If our job isn't to go out and save souls, if our job isn't to save each other, if our job is not considering the concern for one another, if it is not for building each other up, but if it is not for serving each other, then we are not doing what Christ is telling us to do. We need to be able to forgive one another. We need to be able to have love. And we need to be an intimate family as Christ would have the church to be. This is my invitation for all who have not been baptized and would like to be. And, or if you just have questions, please contact any of us at this congregation. Or if you have anything to bring forward, I urge you to go throughout this week and to share your love and light and to speak with salt, and to do as Christ commands you, and just continue to share Christ's love, so that if anyone does not know Christ, they may know him through the way you portray him in your life. We love you guys, and if nothing further, then we will stand for our invitation song.